Dialogue with a Doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians, hosted by Dr. Gregory Leach and Jim York. Good evening and welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. I'm Dr. Gregory Leach and we're here with, along with my co-host Jim York. And tonight we have Dr. Raymond Phillips. He's a practicing uh, gastroenterologist in Naples with the Gastroenterology Group of Naples. And tonight we're going to be talking about colon cancer, colon cancer prevention, colonoscopy. Yep. And, 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 and whatever quality, else. And quality. And quality. quality, and there quality, we go. quality. So, we'll have so, so Dr. Phillips, I know you've been on the show previously, but would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Absolutely, Jim. The, uh, uh, as a gastroenterologist, uh, there's a, a num number of years of training that we go through. Um, uh, I graduated from Princeton, uh, went to a medical school in Washington University in St. Louis. The, uh, and then since I'd gone through uh, college, Princeton, on, a, on an ROTC scholarship, I, uh, after completing my internal medicine residency at uh, Jefferson Hospital and being chief resident, I went on active duty as an internist and was uh, uh, assigned to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I was there for two years and then I was selected uh, for gastrointestinal training, a uh, fellowship in gastroenterology at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And that was completed after two years and then I was on staff at Walter Reed doing research and was part of the, uh, the staff there. Uh, when I uh, exited the Army in 1991, after the first Persian Gulf War, I came down to Naples and have been practicing here since. Uh, since 1991. Now I practice with Dr. Susan Lebersky, Dr. Neil Randall, Michael Marks, and I'm at uh, Khatib, and our practice name is Gastroenterology Group of Naples. And you didn't... Yeah, our, our principal office is in Naples mm -hmm. on Goodlett Road, uh, but we have satellite offices in Bonita Springs as well as in Marco Island. Well, let's, uh, let's start talking about it. Well, yeah, what uh, Greg was saying a moment ago on the issue of, of colon cancer, uh, it, it's a major problem in the United States, you know, more than 50,000 deaths per year related to colon cancer. And over the years, we've made great advances as far as treatment. And our strategy in terms of detection had been one of emphasizing symptoms. That is to say, waiting until an individual had symptoms of bleeding or irregularity before they would be evaluated. But that's, that strategy was not effective in terms of achieving uh, improvement of overall survival. And so about 20 years ago, as we understood the nature of colon cancer, that it is to say it didn't spring up overnight, it evolved from a growth called a polyp and then matured over a period of five or ten years into a cancer, it, it came to be clear that we had the potential of actually preventing a colon cancer from ever developing. And with the advent of colonoscopy, which is a method to examine the entire extent of the colon uh, while an individual is sedated, we can now successfully examine the entire extent of the colon, identify polyps, and remove them. And we've actually demonstrated we can actually prevent a colon cancer from ever developing. So over these last 25 years, our strategy now has shifted from one of, of uh, awaiting till an individual has symptoms to one of, of prevention by uh, intervening uh, with, a uh, with a colonoscopy looking for polyps. And as it turns out, between the age of uh, 50 and 65, that's when polyps begin to be more common, and that's why we encourage people when they get in that age group to go ahead and have a colonoscopy completed. So that's how things stood in the year 2000. Uh, and, and we were congratulating ourselves because we had projected that we could prevent 80 to 90 percent of colon cancer in the United States. And so the gastroenterology community was patting ourselves on the back saying, oh yeah, yes, now we have a means of prevention. There's other tests that can be done as far as prevention, you know, like sigmoidoscopy, which is a short examination of the colon, other patients like detecting microscopic blood. But the reality is though those tests have not provided the degree and, of, uh, and effectiveness that colonoscopy has. Now, there are new technologies on the horizon looking at testing stools for DNA for colon cancer, blood tests doing the same thing, 
But those are unproven technologies right now, and we're talking about what's available and what's effective. At any rate, the, the, the gastroenterology community was patting ourselves on the back in the year 2000, uh, convinced now that we could prevent colon cancer in 80 to 90 percent of all uh, all of, uh, of Americans. But the reality was, in the first decade of the 2000s, it was clear we were not achieving that goal. We were at best only preventing 30 or 40 percent of, of colon cancer. And it was uh, apparent for several different reasons when this was investigated. One is that when we did more detailed studies looking at who was doing colonoscopy, it was clear that you needed to be highly trained to be able to, be, to do a successful examination. So it turns out gastroenterologists are far better than anybody else as far as doing this examination. So that was one point that was discovered. Uh, the other point uh, that was discovered is, is that the, um, uh, the colon is four or five feet long, and it was apparent that we were successful as far as preventing colon cancer in the lower third of the colon, but not in the upper one half. And when we looked in that more, uh, more, more detailed, uh, it was revolving around several different points uh, as far as the, um, uh, the actual examination itself. And, um, and we'll go into those points in some detail. But, but the notion was is that we were increasingly finding that if we didn't do a thorough and effective examination, uh, we weren't getting uh, the, the best possible results. So uh, a number of different areas were looked at, and we'll go into each of those in terms of, 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 of effectiveness. So conceptually, I think you had on a previous show mentioned that most, if, if not all, colon cancers develop on a polyp. That's correct. And, and let me digress. So, yeah. if, so yeah. the theory, I guess, I, I guess was originally thought you could get 90 percent by looking at these polyps, but the reason you haven't been getting 90 percent is because you can't see them or can't find them, or what is the reason? Well, uh, you hit two out of the three reasons. Uh, that is to say, and just to digress, uh, the nature of what a polyp is w within the colon, it's a patch of tissue within the colon that's growing faster than the surrounding tissue. So it's a little patch of tissue within the colon that's growing faster, and it is not allowed, that tissue is not allowed to spread out. It can only accumulate in one location. So over time, as that tissue grows faster, it accumulates in that one location, it begins to grow up and out. It's a slow process. It takes years for a polyp to accumulate to any size. And then over a course of five and seven years, as it grows and larger and larges, additional genetic mistakes accumulate within the polyp, and then sometimes a little cancer cell can emerge within the polyp, and then that can grow up over an additional couple of years to form a full-blown cancer. So the notion had been, the fundamental notion had been, if you can find a polyp and remove it, you can prevent it from ever maturing into cancer. But what was happening, and the reason why we were not getting uh, in the early 2000s, the success rate we wanted was that, uh, for one, uh, the examinations often were not being done by uh, effective operators, that is to say gastroenterologists. Two, it, the, the examinations themselves, instead of investing effort to do a very careful examination, sometimes the examinations were not done as carefully and, and as much time was not as invested to be able to get a good result. And that, that makes sense. If you invest time and you do a good job, you get good results. And that's what we found with this as well. Uh, the other point, it, it relates to preparation. If you cannot see a polyp because the preparation has been poor, then you cannot do anything about it. You can't identify it to remove it. So increasingly, it's been clear that the preparation for these examinations is critically important. And that's a team effort. Uh, that requires the person who's undergoing the examination to really understand what the preparation is, to, to adequately prepare as far as hydration and drinking and following the directions appropriately. And increasingly we find now that there are different techniques and improved products that allow us to get a better preparation. So things now are far, far better than they were 
uh, and when I say the preparation is far, far better now than it was uh, 10 years ago or even just five years ago. The final thing, and this was, this was really uh, suspected, but it wasn't clear, is that not all polyps are created equally. You know, there are typically, um, most polyps have the appearance that look like a mushroom, a little stalk, a little head to it, but some polyps have the appearance that looks like a little carpet, slightly raised above the surface. And those are extremely difficult to identify, and they critically require <clears throat> good preparation to identify, to be able to identify them and remove them. The, um, the other point related to that is we found that these polyps act differently than other polyps. They don't take five to 10 years to mature into cancer. They can, over the course of a very brief period of time, two or three years, make that transition. So it, it's apparent to us now that we're dealing with a, um, uh, several different issues, one of which is the issue of quality of the preparation, quality of the examination, quality of the person who's doing the examination, and the other represents the actual biological nature of the polyps that we're dealing with. The majority of polyps have that appearance that are the typical ones we came to expect that look like mushrooms. The minority, about 10 or 15 percent, have that carpet-like appearance, but that's, that minority has, was escaping detection uh, for many, many years, and now it's being identified more readily. So now, with the combination of, of the, uh, with this understanding uh, that we need to identify polyps, with improved preparation, uh, you know, we've been more and more effective. And now the question comes up in our, the gastroenterology community, well, how are we measuring effectiveness? How, are we, uh, how, how can you measure that among your colleagues? How can a consumer, a person who's undergoing these examinations, really judge a particular doctor as far as whether they're effective at what they're doing? Uh, because all doctors say they're good doctors. And, you know, the notion is, gee, uh, what kind of independent measures do you have in terms of quality? And you know, equality is a fundamental issue that's increasingly uh, a, a watchword or buzzword uh, with the new passage of health care legislation is, is everybody says they want quality. Everybody demands quality. But the question is it's very, very hard to define quality. And, and, um, and, and so Increasingly, though, we're developing standards as far as judging the quality of a physician, uh, the quality of a gastroenterologist, and in this particular circumstance, the quality of the type of examination that's being done. A and now we have some very, very objective measures that allow uh, uh, us to measure quality and the consumers and now increasingly insurance companies to be able to measure quality as well. So I'll just pause for a moment and let you... So is, 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 is quality is not defined by the speed at which you can do this procedure? Well, or years... Or is, or is it, there's a minimum speed, or...? Well, years ago, uh, the, uh, when colonoscopy was first being done, you know, this was 30 or 40 years ago, uh, the notion was, gosh, if you were able to do a complete examination, that was viewed as, gosh, that's, that's a, a good examination. Because if you were able to examine the entire colon, well, that makes sense. You can be able to detect polyps anywhere throughout the colon. And that's one standard. That is to say, being able to examine the entire five feet of colon. And a gastroenterologist should be able to do that 99 times out of 100. Now, occasionally, you'll have someone with a special anatomy that makes it uh, not possible to do. But that's the standard now, that, you, that a gastroenterologist uh, should be able to examine the entire uh, colon 99 times out of 100. The other standard is it used to be, well, gee, how rapidly you can do it. Now it's increasingly becoming not how quickly you can do, but how much time you're investing as far as inspection. Because as I said before, it, like all things in life, if you invest effort, if you're careful, you'll have better results. And we found this is the case as well in colonoscopy. If you invest the effort to do a careful examination, you'll get far, far better results as far as detecting polyps. Maybe we can go to break here. Mm -hmm. um, break? Yeah. yeah. But we're going we're to take a...
short break. Um, and after that break, we'll come back and talk more about specifically colonoscopy, uh, some details related to colonoscopy, and quality. Quality. We'll right Remember that, quality. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> I had been a, a practicing orthopedic surgeon for a number of years and I thought that I was invincible to the multitude of medical problems I saw around me every day. I uh, was quite shocked when I received a phone call telling me that I had cancer of the prostate. Dr. David Spellberg of Naples Urology Associates is the local specialist in treating prostate cancer with the new CyberKnife radiation treatment. Once I got myself together was to do as much research as I could and what I was looking for was a treatment that would give me the least risk of complications and side effects and that's where the CyberKnife came into the picture. Advanced CyberKnife technology Precise. It sends just the right dose of radiation to the cancerous areas. Fast. Each treatment is only one hour, non-invasive. This outpatient procedure has almost no side effects. The day after my treatment, I was out playing golf, and I'm looking forward now to continuing to enjoy a long and happy and comfortable life thanks to the care of my team of doctors and to the CyberKnife procedure. Learn more about CyberKnife and Dr. Spielberg. Call today. Good evening and welcome back to Dialogue with a Doctor. We're here this evening with Dr. Raymond Phillips. He's a practicing gastroenterologist in Naples, Florida, and we've been talking about colonoscopy uh, as a tool to prevent colon cancer. And I think, Jim, you had a question, or you were going to start to ask a question. Well, I was just going to ask, you know, maybe what questions does a patient ask a doctor when he goes in to, um, to uh, interview a doctor for doing this or how long does the procedure m maybe take? Well the, those, are, those are key questions and, and that's why I've, I've been dwelling on this on these, on these points in, in terms of understanding how polyps evolve and, and, uh, and these different uh, issues we've talked is that in a practical sense when an individual is considering gee I need to have this examination done how, how do I uh, when I interact with the doctor how do I judge whether this doctor is good at doing this right. how do I what questions do I ask uh, rather than just hoping for the best and you know, the questions that, that, that an individual is undergoing should ask is gee uh, what, what's your safety uh, profile as far as this examination goes the safety profile as far as issues in terms of bleeding or, or potential injury to the colon uh, the other, and, and those are fundamental ones, but uh, increasingly the issue is how effective are you as far as detecting polyps? Because our whole conversation ha has been of a strategy of finding polyps and removing that. The fundamental question is how effective are you, Dr. Phillips, at finding an, uh, polyps so they can be removed? And we finally developed standards that, that uh, gastroenterologists across the nation should adhere to as far as a detection rate. It's called a polyp detection rate. And generally uh, what should occur is that uh, a gastroenterologist should have a polyp detection rate of 20 percent. And what's meant by 20 percent? That's a minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, it, what's meant by 20 percent is that if say a hundred people are undergoing this examination uh, a hundred, uh, hundred individuals between the age of 50 and 60. There should be at least 25% rate of polyps present in those individuals. So the expectation is you should have a polyp, a polyp detection rate of at least 20 to 25%. At least 20% is, is the current standard. So the notion is, is, is it's increasingly being called a polyp detection rate uh, and that's what uh, we're using as a measure of quality, a measure of effectiveness for gastroenterologists doing a colonoscopy is that particular percentage. And increasingly now gastroenterologists are, are accumulating that information on themselves and they can provide that information to uh, an individual, a consumer, who's undergoing this examination. And it should be one of the questions that an individual should ask. How good are you at doing this? What is your protection rate? What is your safety profile for doing this? Uh, instead of just saying, hey, I hope for the best and I hope you do a good job. Uh, because now we, we really do have standards that we're trying to achieve. And um, now other, other areas are being looked at or being evaluated. 
uh, and, and as far as fine-tuning this, but right now that seems to be the best standard. Is, you, you talked about the prep. Can you talk just a little bit more about prep or proper prep or what's the best way to do it? And, you know. Well, the preparation is critically important. For, for gastroenterologists to do, do their best job, they need the, the cooperation uh, of, of the patient. It's a team effort. So I can only do my best job if, a, if an individual who's doing this preparation does a good job on their preparation. And, and that uh, there are many, many different products that are out there uh, on the market. They're all very, very effective. And uh, if you follow the directions, you know, the overwhelming majority of individuals will have good results. The uh, things that can be done for an individual to have even better results are one, following the directions. <laughs> that always makes a big difference, uh, following directions. The other that's, that's very important is that uh, people are very goal-oriented. And what I mean by that is that when you give them directions, they generally follow the directions but often to the exclusion of everything else. They forget that, gee, they need to maintain a certain level of hydration. And when they're in the process of drinking a liquid preparation, they forget that that liquid preparation is designed not to be absorbed at all. It's actually a medical marvel to drink liquids into your GI tract, which has been designed over uh, millions and millions of years to absorb fluid, to absorb electrolytes, to absorb salt and potassium. And here you are drinking this fluid that's designed, none of it, to be absorbed into your bloodstream. But nonetheless, when people drink fluids, they feel like they're taking in fluids and they are not. So what will often happen mm -hmm. in the process of preparation, a person's not taking in their usual amount of food, they're not taking, or any food, they're not taking in their usual amount of liquids, they become increasingly dehydrated, and the preparation doesn't work as well. And then the individual feels weak, light, heavy, queasy, and blames it all on the preparation, when in reality, it's their underlying developing dehydration that, that's provoking this. And unfortunately, because we live in Florida, almost everybody in Florida is dehydrated. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and as a consequence, you know, the, you're starting out dehydrated, and then you're doing something that's accentuating that. And, and then as a result, by the end of the preparation period, an individual may feel really weak or washed out or, uh, because of uh, that, uh, that issue of not only taking in a, uh, the usual amount of calories, but being compounded by dehydration. So you need the hydration in order to flush the colon, is that your point? Well, the hydration is important, um, uh, and, and you've summed it up right there, is that the, um, and I don't want to get too technical, but there's a tremendous amount of fluid shifts that occur within your gastrointestinal system. Um, and well, well, I will get technical. You take in about two quarts of fluid a day. Your saliva glands produce about a quart of fluid. Your stomach produces about a quart of fluid. Your liver produces about a quart of fluid. Your pancreas produces about a quart of fluid. And your small intestine produces about nine quarts of fluid. So when you add that up, it's like 14 uh, liters or 14 quarts of fluid that your GI tract is taking in. And at the end of the day, only about a quarter of a quart, about 250 cc's, comes out your rear end. So your body is very effective in terms of taking all that fluid in, absorbing it, and only putting a little bit out. And so it's a tremendous amount of fluid uh, shifts that are occurring inside of you. And if you're not taking, if you're dehydrated, all those fluid shifts diminish and you don't get as much of a flushing action like you were mm -hmm. describing, Greg. So it's just a, um, uh, the upshot is, gee, you're right. The, the preparation doesn't work as well when you're dehydrated, just like your mouth gets dry, you don't sweat uh, when you get dehydrated. You know, th the same thing happens on the inside. And the colon secretes that fluid and reabsorbs it, secretes it and reabsorbs it. Yeah, and, and your whole GI tract does, mm -hmm. and so you get that, that event. And I don't mean, I don't mean to be technical on that. It's just that you know, there's a lot going on in your GI tract, and as a result, it, they, um, 
uh, the thought is that, gee, the preparation works better if you're hydrated. And if you really work on drinking, you know, a lot of people say, well, I drank eight glasses of water a day. I'm, surely I'm hydrated. Well, if you're out in the desert, eight glasses of water is nothing. You know, and when I was in the Army if, on active duty, if you're out in the desert, you might have to drink two gallons of water a day just to be barely hydrated in, in a desert environment. So it, uh, the better judge in terms of hydration is your urine output the clarity of the urine, the, urine the, the volume of the urine that you're putting out, and that's probably a better judge. Now, of course, there's a special individuals, you know, individuals with kidney failure, it's a little bit harder to judge, uh, but uh, in general, for most individuals undergoing this, you know, that's a, a good rule of thumb. We have a short period of time left, and I just want to briefly ask you about capsule endoscopy, because that seemed to be popular for a little while, and patients latched onto it because their thought was they, they didn't have to go through this colonoscopy right. process. But I, I just don't see much of that being done. Well, a capsule endoscopy, just to recap um, for, for the viewers, is, is a device. It's a miniature video camera about the size of a vitamin pill that is able to transmit radio signals back to a receiver on the individual's waist takes two to four pictures per second, and then in the course of traversing the GI tract, takes anywhere from 70 to 80,000 pictures, uh, and those pictures are then uh, uh, transformed into a video that allows a viewer to be able to examine the entire extent of the, the GI tract. Uh, the technical limitations is that that technique is terrific for the stomach, a terrific for the small intestine, um, because there's a fairly rapid transit through the stomach mm -hmm. and the small intestine of anywhere from four to six hours. But it's just not effective because it takes two days to go through the colon, uh, and there's, it's not effective for examining the entire extent of the colon. Right. So it's not been yet to really developed, as other technologies have not really developed to really compete with the colonoscopy and, and, at this point. And the virtual colonoscopy, the CT doesn't compete much? Well, the virtual either. colonoscopy is a technique where using a CT scan, you're able to reconstruct two-dimensional images into a three-dimensional image uh, of the entire colon, and then you're able to do computer processing to get the impression as if you're inside the colon through the colon. And it, it's able to achieve uh, very effective images down to four to five millimeters in size. The trouble is that it's so effective, it's detecting so many polyps, it creates a, a lot of uh, difficulties in that many individuals undergoing this are now having to undergo a colonoscopy. So as a screening tool, it's leading to more and more tests rather than fewer tests. Plus, if the prep's no good, it's no good. Well, and that's, that's another aspect of it. it and also, uh, col uh, virtual colonoscopy involves radiation, which is another uh, key point. Well, I want to thank you for coming this evening, and I think we could, you could speak for another hour. Uh, at least, at yeah, least. There's a lot, <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot to learn about this. But, but we, we thank you for coming, and we would love for you to come back and talk on another subject another night. But oh, great. Well, thanks thank for having me, Jim and Greg. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Well, yeah. with a doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians, hosted by Dr. Gregory Leach and Jim York. Good evening and welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. We're here this evening with Dr. Raymond Phillips. He's a practicing gastroenterologist in Naples, Florida. 
He practices with the gastroenterology group of Naples, and you have four or five gastroenterologists? There's a total of five of us yeah. together, yes. And we're going to be, we will be talking about um, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, reflux, acid reflux, and esophageal cancer. So. Well, Dr. Phillips, um, why don't you just introduce yourself? I know you've been on the show several times, but maybe we have some new viewers that... Uh, oh, sure, sure, Jim. Yeah, let me just uh, give you a rundown uh, what a gastroenterologist is. And that's what I am, a board-certified gastroenterologist. Uh, I, I went to um, a college. I graduated from Princeton University, cum laude. Uh, I went through college on an ROTC scholarship, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But after um, I went to uh, Washington University and St. Louis Medical School, and then I did my internal medicine training at uh, Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, and I was chief resident there for a fourth year. Uh, when I concluded that training, the Army remembered where I was, and they brought me back on active duty, and they sent me to a place called Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And that's where I served as an internist, uh, an adult uh, internal medicine doctor, for two years. And then I was selected for gastroenterology training, and I was trained at Walter Reed Army Medical Center for two years as, in gastroenterology. And then subsequent to that, I was selected to be on staff at Walter Reed, where I spent an additional two years uh, doing reading on the uh, professional staff. In 1991, after the first Persian Gulf War, I, uh, I uh, uh, my obligation was complete, and I entered the civilian life, and I came down to Naples, where I've been practicing ever since. And I practiced with Dr. Um, uh, Lebersky, Susan Lebersky, Neil Randall, Michael Marks, and uh, Ahmed uh, Khatib. And we have offices in Naples in Good on Goodlett Road, as well as uh, satellite offices in Benita and uh, in Marco Island. Well, then do tell us what a gastroenterologist does okay. before we get on to acid. Well, a, a gastroenterologist, in its, in its essence, is a tummy doctor. And, and uh, not to diminish what we do, uh, because it's a broad range of, of issues that we deal with. The Army particularly emphasized gastroenterology uh, because that's one of the major symptoms that troops uh, suffer with or have or lead to disability with. Uh, in, um, in on active duty, that is to say gastrointestinal issues. Uh, in particular, over the course of, of thousands and thousands of years, issues in terms of gastrointestinal illnesses like diarrhea were the major causes for armies not uh, failing uh, on campaigns. So there's been a great emphasis in gastroenterology in, in the context of the Army and our, um, uh, uh, all the way from uh, well, at any rate, a great emphasis on, on gastroenterology. Now, uh, as, a, as a gastroenterologist, we deal with problems all the way dealing from um, issues relating to taste as well as consuming food, digestion, and by, as point of digression, we're the only specialty that's specifically trained in nutrition and digestion. It seems like when you get on watch TV, all the doctors on TV want to be gastroenterologists because they talk about nutrition, they talk about digestion, but we're the only specialty that's specifically trained in that. Um, but more to the point, we deal with all gastrointestinal issues from the mouth all the way to the very end of your GI tract, as well as issues with associated with the pancreas, the, the gallbladder, and the liver. So it's a broad range of topics, many, many different areas of interest uh, that are very exciting. But today, you know, we were actually turning our attention to one of the most common symptoms in the United States, uh, the issue of heartburn and how that particular condition can lead to substantial side effects and, and consequences that also have medical attention. In particular, the one that has gotten our most attention recently is the increasing association between heartburn and the formal name for heartburn. That's actually one symptom, but the overall uh, condition is called gastroesophageal reflux disease, where stomach contents, instead of remaining within the stomach, reflux up into the esophagus. And, um, you know, the normal circumstance when you swallow food uh, is that uh, is that when you chew and swallow food as it makes its progression from your mouth through the esophagus, uh, at the point where the esophagus joins the stomach, there's a valve that opens to allow passage of food or liquid into the stomach. And then that valve closes shut to prevent backwash or food or fluid from the stomach up into the esophagus, but also to contain or keep acid in the stomach itself. <clears throat> but when that valve does not function well, when it relaxes or it's inefficient in terms of its function, acid in the stomach can
can wash up or reflux up, which is the formal scientific name, up into the esophagus. Now, the lining of the stomach is specifically designed to tolerate uh, an uh, uh, acid. Just remember in your high school chemistry, you, as you recall, uh, acid is measured on a pH scale, from a pH of 1, which is extremely acidic, to a pH of 14. And a 7 is neutral. That's close to what the pH of your, of your bloodstream is. And so your stomach has a pH of 1. And it'll maintain that pH throughout uh, your entire lifetime. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, your stomach is well designed to tolerate that degree of acidity, but your esophagus is not. And so if you get in that circumstance where this valve that separates the esophagus from the stomach is not working properly, acid washing up into the esophagus will literally burn the esophagus and, and create an injury. So when you feel a burning, it is burning uh, your esophagus. It, it also can be silent. Well, and that's a key point. And, and um, heartburn, you know, I said that several times, it is a burning sensation you feel in your chest radiating up to your throat. Uh, but there are many, many other symptoms associated with reflux disease. And for years, we just focused in on the obvious things and, and, and sourness. But there can be many, many other symptoms that are not as apparent. Uh, symptoms such as <clears throat> clearing of the throat. Uh, as a result of irritation to the back of the throat, uh, change in quality of the voice as a result of uh, in, uh, injury to the vocal cords, or hoarseness or raspiness to the voice, sometimes polyps on the vocal cords, uh, aggravation of asthma, uh, development of sinus infections or sinus inflammation, uh, other things such as chest pain or issues in terms of a lump in the throat, you know, the, or, or a chronic cough. These are all symptoms that uh, are particularly distracting here in Florida because some of those same symptoms are symptoms you see in the context of someone who has allergies. 80% of Floridians have allergies to something in the environment because of, all, of the different things that are growing in the environment. And many of the same symptoms I've mentioned, sinus inflammation, clearing of the throat, cough, are the kind of things, a uh, sensation of post-nasal drip, are the kind of things that you see with uh, allergy. So there are many, many other uh, symptoms uh, that have been come under the designation quote-unquote silent, but nonetheless are, are related to reflux. But so we've, we've come to have a broader understanding of the nature of reflux, and increasingly we've realized that there's a large proportion of the population has reflux on a fairly regular basis. And those individuals uh, are increasing concern. Just to digress, the, the market uh, for treatment of, of heartburn or reflux symptoms, it's a $5 billion a year industry. When you include drugs from antacids like Tums or Rolates, no endorsement there, just, just mentioning the names, uh, but uh, to drugs such as Nexium and Prevacid and Dexalant and Asifex and Prilosec, these, uh, and to say nothing uh, of the forebears like Zantac and Tagamet as well as Pepsin, this is a, a gigantic industry all devoted for the control of acid production uh, within, uh, within the stomach itself. Does this affect different age groups or different, uh, you know, how, how does it affect different people? Well, it, it does, uh, it, know, it, 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 it does seem to affect adults uh, uh, more than, than adults or, or children. And, and there are things that adults do that are not well considered in terms of, of increasing weight, for example. Um, increasing weight promotes reflux. Okay. So if you store a lot of fat in your abdomen, there's less room for the stomach to expand, more pressure on the stomach, and more of a tendency to have reflux from the stomach to the esophagus. So the, the growth of America and the growth of individuals in particular has led to increased problems with reflux. So there's a direct correlation with obesity. Um, the other point is that uh, adults tend, uh, well, uh, tend to, uh, well, eat more. <laughs> and, uh, the, and as a result of uh, greater volumes of food, uh, that can promote reflux. Certain foods that taste good uh, will promote reflux. And, and what I mean by that is that when you eat food that is particularly tasty, typically it has a high fat content. And that fat promotes reflux 
because it relaxes that valve and allows stomach acid to flow more easily up into the esophagus. So um, the kind of foods that are enjoyable, you eat a lot of them, and then the stomach takes time to empty. If you eat foods, it typically, uh, a rich meal takes two or three hours to empty. Well, the nature of America is such as people work late, they eat late, they're tired, they go to bed, and there's not sufficient time for the stomach to empty out. And then when you're horizontal, you no longer have gravity, gravity to help hold things into your stomach. And there's a, a tendency to have a nighttime reflux that can be very, very troublesome. So you're saying <clears throat> the later you eat, it might not be as good for you. Well, precisely, and that's the nature uh, of, of, of living uh, in Naples. Right. You know, the uh, individuals, they, they, they socialize, they go out to dinner, they have a nice dinner, they eat foods and that promote reflux. You know, they, you know, in terms of a rich meal, alcohol, chocolate in particular promotes reflux. Right. You finish the meal with a little mint, which is an Arabic custom that promotes relaxation of this uh, valve, so you can have a discreet uh, burp at the end of the meal to express your pleasure at the meal. And this was very common in Arabic cultures in, in the 700s and the 800s, but, <coughs> and it's continued now. But that mint promotes reflux as well. And then you go home, lay down, and, and then you reflux because you don't have gravity to help hold things in your stomach. So there's a number of different points, uh, uh, if different issues, that can promote reflux. Uh, and it can cause a lot of symptoms, like we've talked about, but it actually can cause a physical burn to the esophagus. And, and because of that injury to the esophagus and the consequences of it, we're realizing there's a connection between reflux and the development of esophageal cancer. And that has received increasing attention now because the rates of esophageal cancer have been rising in the last 20 years. Uh, it's the only cancer uh, that, that we follow that is actually the rates have been increasing over these last 20 years, almost tripling uh, over this last 20 years. And the sequence of events is, is as follows, is that reflux of acid leads to a, little, uh, a, a literal burn of the esophagus. And as we were describing, the linings of the esophagus is, is in layers. And it's the innermost layer that gets burned away. And when it gets burned away, the esophagus develops a new layer that can better resist acid. And it's called Barrett's esophagus. And uh, that Barrett's esophagus, although protective to the esophagus, entails some risk. Uh, because that Barrett's esophagus sometimes can develop cancer cells that can mature into full-blown esophageal cancer. We're gonna, we're, we will take a short break mm -hmm. okay. just for right. a few right. minutes right. um, and we'll come back to talk with Dr. Phillips in just, just a few minutes. Right. I had been a, a practicing orthopedic surgeon for a number of years and I thought that I was invincible to the multitude of medical problems I saw around me every day. I uh, was quite shocked when I received a phone call telling me that I had cancer of the prostate. Dr. David Spellberg of Naples Urology Associates is the local specialist in treating prostate cancer with the new CyberKnife radiation treatment. Once I got myself together was to do as much research as I could and what I was looking for was a treatment that would give me the least risk of complications and side effects and that's where the CyberKnife came into the picture. Advanced CyberKnife technology Precise. It sends just the right dose of radiation to the cancerous areas. Fast. Each treatment is only one hour and invasive. This outpatient procedure has almost no side effects. The day after my treatment, I was out playing golf, and I'm looking forward now to continuing to enjoy a long and happy and comfortable life thanks to the care of my team of doctors and to the CyberKnife procedure. Learn more about CyberKnife and Dr. Spellberg. Call today. Welcome back to Dialogue with the Doctor. Once again, we're here this evening with Dr. Raymond Phillips. He is a practicing gastroenterologist and a very good one in Naples, Florida here. We're talking about acid reflux, esophageal scarring, which is called Barrett's esophagus. And we just got finished, uh, Dr. Phillips just got finished describing what that is. It causes scarring and makes a new layer 
Yeah, yeah let, let me recap that for you. Uh, and first you need to understand the esophagus and the whole GI tract for that m matter, but we'll just emphasize the, the esophagus, it is um, developed in layers, like layers of onion. And it's the innermost layer of the esophagus, which is the one that can become injured as a result of reflux of acid. And that innermost layer can literally be burned away. And when it's burned away, the esophagus develops a new layer that's capable of resisting that acid. And that condition was discovered by a Dr. Barrett in the 1950s, and it came to hold his name over the years called Barrett's esophagus. Now, you need to understand, that's a kind of rare event, Barrett's esophagus. Uh, and it only happens in people who have severe reflux symptoms. And severe reflux symptoms are individuals that are having heartburn three to four times per week, uh, not someone who's having it every now and then. So if someone that has heartburn three to four times a week uh, if you take 100 of them, individuals with that kind of symptom, maybe only 10 of that 100 will develop Barrett's esophagus. Now, if you develop Barrett's esophagus, as I said before, it's a new lining you were not born with, but it does protect the esophagus. It has a slight potential of evolving into a cancer of the esophagus. And, and that's a rare uh, risk, but a real one. So if you take 500 people with Barrett's esophagus, maybe one of them in the course of a year's time might evolve into a cancer of the esophagus. So the risk, the risk is rare, but nonetheless, it's a risk. And so we've, we've cautioned people who have had bad heartburn that it would be worthwhile to consult with your doctor and, and to control the heartburn and to perhaps be evaluated to see if there's any sign of any injury, in particular to see if there's any sign of any of this condition called Barrett's esophagus. Now, you might say, well, what would you do about it if you found something like that? Uh, well, if we found Barrett's esophagus, we do biopsies to see if there's any microscopic changes that might put you at risk for cancer of the esophagus. And for years, that was all we could do, was to come back periodically, check, see if there was any sign of that. And if you, it looked like there was developing cancer cells, the response would be, yes, let's remove the esophagus. A very, very large operation associated with significant mortality a lot of morbidity, uh, but several years ago, a new technology was developed that now allows us now an alternative approach for treating this condition. So again, the condition is if you have Barrett's esophagus and if you've done biopsies and identified developing cancer cells, again, that's a rare event, but if you identify developing cancer cells, now there's a way of treating it that does not involve an operation. And, and what can be done is that there's a way of actually um, applying heat to the innermost lining of the esophagus and essentially burning away that, that lining. And by burning away that lining and then taking medications to reduce acid in the stomach, when that lining regrows, it resets itself back to normal. Uh, that is to say, it develops a normal lining once more. And, uh, and the Barrett's esophagus is, is uh, at least in the preliminary studies that we follow now over several years, is eliminated permanently. So we've been very excited about this because now we have a means of being able to, uh, if, we, if we find an individual with Barrett's esophagus, we identify ad uh, developing cancer cells, now we have a means of treating that without subjecting that individual to an operation of the esophagus. And we've gotten very, very excited indeed about that because it, it, re it represents a great innovation uh, and means of being able to provide care without uh, inflicting a lot of injury and harm uh, to individuals. Now, let me digress for a moment. A lot of people say, well, Dr. Phillips, I'll just take something to reduce acid and that'll make a difference. By itself, that will not make a difference. Hundreds of studies have been done now investigating, controlling reflux, and whether that will make Barrett's esophagus go away. It won't. It remains unchanged uh, for the most part. So this is the only technology now that we have available, intervention that we have short of, uh, of an operation to, to eliminate uh, the Barrett's esophagus and to actually prevent a progression from a cancer cell to a full-blown cancer. Are, are you... Is that procedure reserved 
for patients who have a biopsy that's abnormal, or, or do you do that on all people, all patients with Barrett's esophagus? And, and that's a key point, Greg, is that, you know, we, we reserve that, that treatment not for all people with Barrett's esophagus, but rather instead those individuals in whom you do a biopsy and you show a developing cancer cell. This intervention is specifically for those people uh, because, as I said before, the majority of people with Barrett's esophagus will never go on to develop anything serious. Uh, and so you don't need to subject all those people to a treatment uh, and when the risk of developing something serious in the future uh, would be very, very small. Do, do you have to keep biopsying? Or if, if somebody has a negative biopsy, do you have to wait five years and do it again? Or well, that, and that's a key point. And that's a key point. Uh, is that uh, Barrett's esophagus, you, you do need to do biopsies periodically. Uh, initially, we'll do an initial set of biopsies that are very thorough. And then if no sign or developing cancer cells are present, we'll come back a few le years later and do it once more. Much like when we do colonoscopies on individuals who have polyps, uh, if we do an examination and remove a polyp, we know they have a, a tendency to form polyps, we'll come back in an interval perhaps five years later. For, for an issue of Barrett's esophagus, if we do a biopsy, confirm the Barrett's esophagus, but they have no sign of any cancer cells, yeah, we'll come back in three years' time to do a further set of biopsies to look to see if any change changes over that interval. If I send you a patient who has acid-related symptoms, who do you biopsy, or who do you scope? You don't scope them all. No, 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 and because that would be half the United States. <laughs> that'd be too much. To, that'd be too much to do. So the, um, uh, but. The, the, what we do is try to identify, we try to select individuals that have significant reflux. And what we define as significant reflux is an individual that's having heartburn three to four times per week, and individuals that have, has had that for a period of time. I'm not talking about someone who went on vacation on a cruise and attended every dinner meeting uh, at the cruise and then had heartburn the whole cruise long. I'm talking about someone who's had heartburn on a weekly basis for, for two to three years and having on a weekly basis, having it several times per week. That's how you can select out individuals who, who may be at more risk. So even if that patient came in to me and I treated them with an antacid, made their symptoms completely go away, that person should be scoped? They should if they can recall a time when they had significant uh, heartburn and reflux and it was going on and on. Yeah for years and years, and then they finally encountered you, you put them on effective therapy, and, and, they, and the heartburn went away, but they remember, gosh, for five years before I saw Dr. Mm -hmm. Leach, things were just terrible. Uh, then yeah, they, they would probably deserve at least one examination of the esophagus to be confident that they didn't have any sign of, of Barrett's esophagus. So. You can scar the esophagus too? Occasionally we send you a patient who you have to open the esophagus or dilate the esophagus. That, that's true, and, and um, uh, we, we've been dwelling on the issue that when you have reflux and it causes an injury, it can burn away aligning the esophagus, but sometimes it doesn't. It just burned, and then the burn heals. And just like if you get a burn on your skin, it forms scar tissue, the same thing can occur within your esophagus, is that when you get a burn in the esophagus, it can lead to scar tissue, but the, the nature of the esophagus, it's a cylinder. It's a round structure. So when you form scar tissue in a circle, it tends to constrict and narrow the diameter of the esophagus. Because if you notice, you know, if you've ever cut yourself, the edges of the wound are pulled together, mm -hmm. and they're pulled together because of scar tissue that's forming within the wound. But when you form scar tissue in a circle, it tends to like a, a increasing narrowing of the esophagus. And then foods that have more substance, like meat or bread and so forth, can come to that narrowed area and get stuck. And those individuals, uh, they need a different intervention. They actually, as you described, need to have the esophagus dilated to stretch out that scar tissue so food doesn't get uh, stuck at other times. So given that we have a $5 billion industry of antacid sales, we have these over-the-counter, Prilosec and Prevacid are over-the-counter, they're excellent uh, acid blockers. So a patient can be treating themselves without seeing a physician, which in a way is good, but in a way is not good if 
they haven't been properly examined? How do you, how do you? Well, and, and that's an issue, and that's why the FDA, when they approve these drugs for over-the-counter use, they put these frightening, uh, they put these frightening uh, warnings on Prilosec OTC as well as Prevacid that do not use beyond two <coughs> weeks because you've got to see a doctor after two weeks, not because the drug is dangerous, it's because the drug is so safe and effective. Uh, the concern of the FDA was just precisely what you said, Greg, is that an individual would uh, hit on the medication, successfully treat themselves, and say, well, why do I need to see a doctor? And, and they could self-medicate themselves and have put something potentially serious that needs attention. So, for example, in the context of, say they had an ulcer they were self-medicating and treating, well, the ulcer can come back again and again. That individual needs to be evaluated to see if, if there's any sign of, a, of an infection called helicobacter that may be provoking that ulcer. And in this context, if, if there's an individual with bad reflux, they need to be evaluated to see if they had any complications from that reflux, like Barrett's esophagus. So the notion is that uh, that warning was that if an individual is finding they're having to use medications like that on an ongoing basis, yeah, they probably do need to see a doctor to be more completely evaluated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, it, it's a uh, it's a little bit of a um, we've had great success with these medications. Uh, they're so effective, uh, but and they're so safe now. They're available in a widespread basis, uh, and so it's a caution to to patients everywhere that, you know, if there is heartburn and that's been regularly and you're regularly trying to treat it, yeah, it probably does deserve some uh, an evaluation. And if they need to be scoped, uh, it's not like a colonoscopy. It's, it's much easier to put a scope Well, precisely. Thing. And, and um, doing an examination of the esophagus, again, we, we provide sedation so it, you, you won't even know the examination has been done. Uh, the preparation is straightforward to the extent that you just don't eat any breakfast. Uh, you won't even know the examination has been done. Uh, the, the anesthetic now is so effective. Uh, and so it can be a very, very good experience. Um, so the upshot of talking about reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease in general is, is that there's a number of different manifestations. There's a number of different complications. We talked about Barrett's esophagus and the association with cancer of the esophagus. We talked about scarring in the esophagus. Um, but the notion is if there's chronicity to the heartburn or reflux symptoms, it does deserve evaluation at least once. And, and now there is a prospect, a very real prospect, of being able to prevent serious consequences, you know, like uh, cancer of the esophagus, if an individual uh, can, uh, can be evaluated in a timely way. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Phillips, for coming this evening. Oh, sure. And educating us once again. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Right, thanks so much. Thank thanks, you. Jim. Thank you.